So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the AAPS webinar uh, with our presenters this evening. And uh, the uh, subject matter is uh, the BII, BIA, excuse me, ALCL. Uh, and I have as our uh, moderator, Dr. Mackay, president of the association, and he will introduce the, uh, the speakers this evening. Uh, just one housekeeping item. If you see that at the bottom of your screen, if you scroll your, with your mouse, you'll see there's the option to have a, a chat. And if you click on that, you'll be able to type in questions and uh, get answers during the webinar. We've had a few attendees already start that this evening. If you uh, open up the chat box, you'll see. So uh, without any further delay, I'll hand this over to Dr. Mackay. Thanks, Dan. And uh, thank you, um, Mark and Peter, who will be joining us shortly. Um, so there's there's a lot that has changed in the arena of the BIA ALCL. Our knowledge has increased. Um, last year, I guess it was in October, there was the first international consensus meeting in Rome. Um, and the, I figured that this was a good time to get an update on where we are and what we know about it and get Mark to give us an update on the numbers. So Mark Clemens is going to give us an update on the disease, the numbers, uh, some of the collaboration, whether there's been any change in the treatment um what new do we know about what might be causing this and then once mark's done that peter codero is going to give us um a talk on his and i think it's the largest single surgeon series um with mac macro textured implants so <clears throat> To start off with, by way of disclosure, these are my disclosures. Uh, I hope. Oh, there we go. Um, going back to 2015, uh, the SIG Medical dis, um, sale of a company of which I was a part owner is, was for rib fixation system it has nothing to do with this talk today and i'm no longer involved in the company at all so as i said mark's going to give us an update on the disease incidence etiology and treatment and then peter's going to talk to us about his and it's i do believe this is the largest single surgeon case series on patients with macro textured implants um thank you both mark and peter it took an act almost an act of god to get you guys on the same webinar on the same evening because i know how incredibly busy you are and i really appreciate you doing this thank you mark sure, uh, thank, you. You. thank you so much uh don for helping to uh, organize this tonight and the uh, invitation uh to be able to um, share our updated numbers uh, you know, I was trying to think back in my mind that uh, you've been my mentor going on now about 16 years. Uh, <laughs> and so I've uh, really appreciated your uh, support <clears throat> in this research and um, and uh, ability to uh, update you. Uh, Stan, can you uh, throw the controls over to me so I can uh, share my screen? You should be able to do that at any time. The green you button at the bottom there, Mark. When I selected it, it said, uh, it says you cannot start screen share while the other participant is oh. sharing their. Okay, so Don would need to stop sharing his. All right. <clears throat> uh, here we go. I beg there your pardon. Are. So you should have access to the green button at the bottom now, Mark. You should be able to share a screen, Don. I mean, uh, Mark. Yeah, I've got it. Okay. So uh, 
since we only had uh, 15 minutes for my presentation uh, tonight, uh, I, I knew that I didn't have time to give a, a, a deep foundation or basis um, or background on breast implant ALCL. Instead, in the next uh, 15 minutes, what I really wanted to focus on was what has recently changed. What are practice changes in 2020? Uh, what are recent guideline updates? So I am going to assume that uh, many of uh, the attendees that are watching this have some uh, background knowledge of ALCL. And from that starting point, I want to address the most frequently asked questions that I get, as well as the misconceptions about this disease uh, as well. Um, uh, for disclosures, I don't have any active conflicts of interest. I was a uh, uh, Allergan consultant until 2015. However, uh, really as a direct result of this research, um, I ended that relationship and have not had any other uh, relationships with any other companies since then. I want to start with just a concept, an idea. You only grow by coming to the end of something and by beginning something else by John Irving. And I think that that's apropos of, of what we've seen over the past year with the FDA's decision to perform a class one device recall of Allergan implants on July 24th, 2019. This is a class one device recall. It affects tissue expanders and uh, bio cell covered uh, implants. And let's look at what were the events leading up to that. So we released an article from MD Anderson on August 31st, 2019, of approximately 100,000 breast implant patients. Uh, breast implant ALCL was one of the uh, covered outcomes of that study. Dr. Rorick, in a, um, in a review since then, has called this the largest and most comprehensive epidemiologic study of patient safety and implant specific outcomes for breast implants in the literature. And the exact same day that it was released online, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, the FDA commissioner, called for breast implant safety hearings uh, to look at breast implant ALCL and all aspects of breast implant safety. If we look at the, uh, um, the announcement of that breast implant safety, and then we see a number of other companies doing similar things, such as uh, France uh, recommending also safety advisory hearings. Um, a number of countries restricting the sale of Allergan BioCell and MicroCell. Uh, 33 countries in December 19th, 2018, followed by Brazil, Colombia. We have the FDA hearings and the France hearings uh, last year, um, followed by France suspending macrotextured implants. Uh, while there was some uh, discrepancy in messaging from the FDA, at first they said that Allergan did not meet the banning standard. It's seemingly in response to uh, increasing pressure from other countries, such as Singapore, Canada, and Australia. The FDA finally did call for the class one of call of Allergan BioCell. And then we saw um, uh, Australia even taking a step further to uh, mean all macro textured implants, which affected eight different manufacturers. A lot of the FDA's decision to do this was based on their most recent data, which was very different from their previous data. You can see uh, that they recognized 573 unique pathologically confirmed cases, and that there was a big jump in the number of deaths from nine to 33. What's, what's incredibly important for their decision on the recall was that if implant manufacturer was known, 91% of worldwide cases involved an Allergan BioCell at some point. This is a type of concept that you just can't say enough. I, I think that there's almost a cognitive dissonance um, for physicians that may not know this data to really grasp their hands around what it means that 91% of world cases uh, involved an Allergan biocell device at some point. I, I've done a pictorial representation just to demonstrate what it looks like when 91% are um, um, other um, or are Allergan, and then you have about 9% which are other manufacturers represented. 
in essence, what we actually hope is by the FDA's action last summer, we would actually see a reduction going forward of approximately 91% of world cases, leaving out uh, 9% uh, represented by other implant manufacturers with lower rates of uh, risk with this disease. I say lower risk because it does seem like risk is implant spe manufacturer specific. With Allergan and uh, uh, Silamed polyurethane having the highest risk, Mark, we've lost you. Yeah, it looks like his uh, audio is having some problems. Oh, it's back. <laughs> did I did I lose you there? <laughs> A little bit. We yeah. lost your audio. All right. Um, so, uh, and uh, um, other countries uh, having similar experiences. We see in the United States in 2017. We reported that uh, a, a risk of one in 30,000 in the uh, US population. But in 2017, in that same manuscript, we also showed a six to one ratio between Allergan and Mentor. Uh, Mentor coming in at one in 51,000, Allergan coming in at one in 8,500. And the FDA actually cited this six to one ratio um, as part of their decision to perform the uh, FDA device recall. We see the only prospective series to date by Pat McGuire et al. out of 17,656 patients with eight cases, or one in 2,200. And I'm going to leave the risk discussion at that point because I know that Dr. Cordero has even more updated numbers on risk analysis. If we look around the world, uh, we do see 35 countries now involved with ALCL, and we see 885 total world cases. I can't help but um, uh, think about all the world maps that we've seen over the past week on coronavirus, which obviously uh, completely dwarf uh, data like this. Um, but we can see that there is cases represented all the way around the world. There's no market that's really not uh, untouched. Uh, and we do see approximately 34 deaths worldwide to date. I want to point out in the United States Profile Registry, there are 307 cases that have been reported to profile, though some of these are still in a suspected phase where profile is tracking down details on, that, um, on those cases. What I want to point out is recent outliers. Uh, for instance, we've just recently seen newest cases from Thailand, South Korea times two, Japan and Singapore. We used to think that Asian cases weren't possible, but now those are popping up with increased awareness. We have seen three transgender cases, so it doesn't seem to be uh, gender specific. We also see two gluteal implant cases, so it doesn't seem to be anatomic specific. And very interestingly, we see the very first manuscript about uh, implant entirely different disease, entirely different entity. And in all of these, while there was a breast implant involved, all of them had Epstein-Barr virus co-infection, which seems to be a key characteristic with B-cell lymphomas. Note, only nine. These are, these are um, even more exceptional of cases. Um, also, we have seen two uh, tissue expander cases where it was a tissue expander exchanged to a smooth implant, then followed by the development of the disease. I'll point out, we did write a manuscript about a year and a half ago on the safety and efficacy of smooth surface tissue expanders. We saw that they had lower infection rates and we used them at uh, MD Anderson. It's been exclusively part of my practice since 2017 um, and it, um, however, there's only been two reported tissue expander cases, but it still did lead to part of the FDA recall. Um, this year in January, we saw the newest guidelines come out from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Um, what's important is that now it is more richer with more detail. I won't go through this in detail, but if any of the uh, attendees would like this information, I'd be happy to mail it out, as well as it is free for download 
from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. What we see is that now for the very first time, we have language that the patients can be reconstructed, reconstructed with a smooth implant or an autologous reconstruction. And we see much more granular details on how to achieve a diagnosis. And so this is just the diagnosis guidelines as well as the treatment guidelines. See the vast majority of patients be treated with surgery alone, about 85%, and uh, reserving uh, chemotherapy for more advanced cases are about 15%. We are starting to see an increasing role for radiation therapy. We think in patients where there has been skin invasion. So when the skin is actively involved in the disease, there may be a role for adding on 24 to 36 gray of radiation, but the vast majority of patients only needing uh, surgery. I think it's important to just differentiate between different types of uh, capsulectomies. This is a partial capsulectomy for radiation-induced capsular contracture. This is a total capsulectomy for double capsule. And then this is truly an end block resection that we're performing for an ALCL case. An end block resection is an oncologic procedure, meaning that you get healthy uh, margin around tumor. And that's completely different from a total capsulectomy. I bring this up because we're seeing more and more uh, some patients asking for a prophylactic total capsulectomy and implant removal or exchange. It's important to point out that there is no evidence that a total capsulectomy reduces the risk in an otherwise healthy patient. And we have had three patients develop ALCL years after a total capsulectomy. Uh, in those cases, it was for capsular contracture. So maybe it was less, um, like I showed in the picture uh, before, it's hard to tell if there is a type of procedure that can change your risk. So what I usually say to patients is that it's a bit like uh, being born in a house that has asbestos in it. Um, you can sell that house, you can live in a different house, you can have many houses throughout your entire life, and maybe at the age of 40 or 50, you can develop mesothelioma. It seemingly is that once you've had exposure sometime in your life, you still have the ability to develop it later. That's not to scare patients. It is just to point out that we don't have data on what is a risk-reducing procedure, and therefore we don't, nor society, nor FDA is recommending prophylactic explantation for the approximate 1.5 million women with an Allergan BioCell implant in the United States. We uh, released a study from MD Anderson last summer um, further characterizing how you should work up a suspected and confirmed case. And we actually found that when we took 50 consecutive patients, 88% demonstrated some invasion of the capsule, yet only 6% of our biopsies were actually positive. Just said is that there is a DNA between if you only sample once versus if you do wide sampling of that capsule. Therefore, we determined mathematically that a capsule should be biopsied 12 times per capsule. So let's think about that. If you have a capsule, scar capsule around an implant, think of that as a sphere. That sphere, if it were a cube, has six different sides. Each of those sides being sampled twice would be the 12 sides mathematically to make certain that you have actually properly screened that capsule for disease. This is not just the recommendation of the FDA, but as of two weeks ago, we came out with this manuscript in collaboration with FDA and the National Institutes of Health. It was in the Journal of Clinical Oncology and it defined best practice guidelines for achieving a diagnosis. And it was also highlighted in the New England Journal of Medicine as a new guideline for oncologists to be aware of. It specifically called for that 12 biopsies per capsule, as well as the minimum amount of fluid that you need to get a reliable diagnosis. Then again, I think that this is one of the most important articles to come out, um, at least in uh, this year going forward.
I think Dr. Cordero's was probably the best one last year. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, going forward, uh, the FDA is going to come out with um, uh, changes in breast implant safety. Specifically, they're going to come out with black box warning and standardized patient checklists. We don't know what those look like, so in the image, I've included a standardized checklist as utilized by uh, Germany. That's the only company, country to date that uses standardized patient checklists. However, these are coming in the United States probably within the next few months. And so therefore, they have released draft labeling, and we can see examples of what the FDA is planning to come out with. Not finalized, but possibility. It's going to say that uh, all implants uh, have risk. All implants are not lifetime devices, that there is a risk of BIALCL, as well as some systemic symptoms. What we do see is that um, uh, different responses from the societies with ASPS supporting uh, 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 checklist and black box labeling, uh, whereas the aesthetic society coming out um, against these changes by the FDA. Um, I do find that this 50-50 split is indicative of um, uh, audiences when I give this lecture, and I'll usually uh, ask the audience, what do they think of the FDA's actions? And so I think that this is very much symbolic that we are a split society at this point on these measures. But I think what is important to realize is that in addition to these risk factors, there are additional costs. For instance, uh, one patient, Raylene Holra, presented at ASPS the meeting this past uh, uh, September in which she recounted that her cost was $288,150. There is a financial toxicity associated with breast implant ALCL that goes beyond just the treatment, the chemotherapy, the disease surveillance. We have an upcoming, uh, upcoming article on this, on the cost effectiveness of BI ALCL, coming out with uh, uh, myself, and a professor of economics from MIT, and that should be coming out in a uh, few weeks. And I just want to point out that our general feelings with this is, is a message for manufacturers that anchoring a future business strategy to traditional textured implants is an increasingly futile endeavor. Short-term windfalls generated by scavenging a narrowing market must be weighed against long-term losses and brand value, litigation, and poor patient perception. I also want to encourage the physicians that are watching right now to uh, consider participating in the National Breast Implant Registry, which is specifically recommended by the FDA. Um, and it really gives incredibly granular data about your own practice. Very quickly, I just wanna to touch on some of the research that we are performing with a number of institutions around the world through a centralized tissue repository at MD Anderson. You're going to see uh, upcoming manuscripts. Uh, this one coming from uh, um, uh, a, a manuscript coming soon from Rice University. The perpetual exhaustive phagocytosis and overloading of macrophages uh, leading to inflammatory cytokines, thereby leading to lymphoma genesis. Uh, another one coming out of uh, Cambridge University on the idea of toxins actually coming off of a textured implant, specifically aryl hydrocarbons, uh, mediating lymphoma genesis. This is uh, incredibly interesting work coming from Suzanne Turner uh, that was presented at the First World Consensus Conference on uh, BIALCL this past fall. And uh, we also see uh, some changes or some evolutions in some theories. For instance, this was the bacteria theory. In 2016, it was thought that Raustonia Piketty was leading to ALCL. However, in 2019, the study authors, specifically Anand Diva, no longer feel that Raustonia specifically is a driver uh, for breast implant ALCL. And so that's a big change that we see in that theory. There is some unpublished work that he's hoping to come out later this year, uh, but at this point, it should not be thought of that Raustonia is leading to the development of the disease. So therefore, it is important to realize that no operative strategy has been shown currently to decrease the risk of BI-ALCL. 
um, nothing that surgeons are doing intraoperatively increases or decreases that risk beyond just using a textured breast implant. We do see a number of world clusters of BI ALCL around the world, and this has led some physicians to hypothesize that maybe those clusters had poor technique leading to the development of the disease. I will point out though that only five of those clusters were by the exact same surgeon. When we dial down into those clusters, we actually see that those were very high um, uh, breast implant placement practices where each one of those were frequent speakers specifically on proper breast implant safety. All of them had published extensively, um, even having at least one article on breast implant ALCL per one. And they all had strict follow-up regimens following their patients annually. In comparison, to a Penn State survey by Logan Carr in 2018, demonstrating that only 34% of ASPS members follow their patients for one year, 42% for five years, and only a quarter up to 10 years. Most, patient, most physicians not following their patients long enough to detect this disease, which takes about 10 years to develop. And so therefore, clusters represent improved disease awareness and heightened surveillance and learn term follow-up, but they do not represent poor breast implant technique, which I worry is just a way of shaming surgeons and will ultimately discourage the reporting of cases. Therefore, we have a number of different theories about how it develops. We have a number of different facts that we know do occur uh, to lead to the development of lymphoma genesis. And I won't go through these in detail, but I wanna conclude that breast implant ALCL research is at a tipping point for the advancement and awareness. Regulatory efforts should uh, drastically drop the number of cases while still preserving choice in the marketplace. Improved patient engagement for shared decision-making is one of the consequences, and we are seeing already manufacturers responding to this and driving in innovation in their implant design. And that is a way we will move forward through transparency, innovation, and collaboration. I wanna thank uh, Dr. Mackay, as well as Dr. Cordero, who participated in the first World Consensus Conference on BIL sale in Rome, Italy in October. It, was a, it really exceeded our uh, expectations. We had over 6,000 unique viewers for the online free content to date uh, in 27 countries. This was uh, sponsored by uh, founding sponsors, Cientra, Establishment Labs, GC Aesthetics, Mentor MTF Foundation and Braxon. And I will point out that the second one will be in Houston, Texas, November 6th and 7th. And I invite um, all of the attendees to come uh, to the uh, conference. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mo. That was great. Um, Peter, do you want to give us? Uh, yeah, let me see if I can get on. Data. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, Mark, can you let him go? Did you? Um, I did. Up at, at the top. <clears throat> so, Peter, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a green. Yeah, you may need to scroll over it, but at the bottom, you should see share screen. Uh, Yes, I put the slideshow up and then I lost everything here. Um, uh, as soon as your PowerPoint's back up, just share the screen and you can, you'll okay. see it as you scroll on the bottom. Up. Share screen. That'll be on the Zoom screen. Uh, hit share. There we are. Very ah. good. All right. We're sharing. Put this on the slide. Slideshow. How's that? You're doing you're doing very good. Excellent. Okay. Good. Um, so uh, I was charged with uh, talking about basically my experience uh, with my BILCL, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, the numbers have gone up. And I think it's uh, the question becomes, you know, how worrisome uh, is this? And uh, my disclosure is uh, I, I received funding uh, for participating in the cohesive 410 gel implant study uh, years ago. Uh, 
Uh, similar to Mark, I've not received any uh, funding in the past uh, three to four years from uh, Allergan uh, or any other implant companies. Um, so I think I'm going to skip through what we know, et cetera, as did Mark. But we know that uh, ALCL is not definitively associated with uh, patients with smooth implants. It's more uh, commonly associated with textured implants. And uh, it was finally classified by the WHO as a disease in 2016. It presents as a spectrum of diseases. Uh, Mark already went over an update. Uh, and I think the significant uh, point, uh, as far as I know to date, there has been no clinical history of uh, purely smooth devices um, uh, as compared to all the well-documented uh, cases being in patients with textured implants. Uh, so this is not. So um, what I'd like to focus on is what the current literature is pertinent to risk and uh, how uh, it compares to uh, what I've found with my patients. So to quickly go over some of the background, Gary Brody um, back in uh, 2015, 173 cases uh, looking through the entire literature. At that point, this was literally only five years ago, the risk estimates were one in 500,000 to one in 3 million. Uh, Mark and his group uh, uh, looked at 100 cases in the U.S. 1996 to 2015 uh, and uh, demonstrated an incidence of about 1 in 30,000. Uh, this is Pat McGuire's study, and I, uh, it was really to uh, prospectively look at uh, patients with allergan implants with the four tens. I participated in this. There were about 17,000 patients. And within the publication, there were uh, four cases of ALCL mentioned. And I think Mark updated this and uh, pointed out that, so that, that makes it about one in 3,500. Uh, he says that there are now eight cases um, within that cohort, which makes it somewhere in the one in 2,000 range. Uh, the Dutch uh, looked at uh, what their experience was, 43 cases. This was uh, JAMA 2018. And uh, based on uh, an estimated denominator, uh, and this is the point about most of these studies, is that all the denominators are estimated. Uh, they came up with uh, an incidence of about one in uh, 7,000 patients in Holland. The Australian, uh, uh, the first paper in 2017, 55 cases, uh, broke down uh, the um, risk uh, between, between different types of brands, so the biocell, one in 3,800, polyurethane implants, one in 7,800, and Siltex, or Mentor, one in 60,000, uh, and they pointed out that the, there is an increased risk of developing ALC uh, once you get out to about eight to 12 years, and I think this has uh, pretty much been borne out by most other large series. So what are the current published lifetime risks? The, ASPS thinks it's somewhere in the one in 3,000 to one in 30,000 range. The TGA, which is the equivalent of the FDA, one in 1,000 to one in 10,000. In the Netherlands, about one in 7,000. Health Canada, one in 24,000. And there are large variations uh, between the different uh, countries that report their uh, uh, incidences. And I think it's probably not related to uh, their genetic predisposition, but more likely uh, based on the accuracy of reporting. And again, uh, in most of these situations, they're, they're all estimates on what the denominator is, and they're based on implant sales or estimates of implant sales, uh, et cetera. So when you look at the risks, uh, this is a paper uh, from uh, Anand Deva in, in the supplement, uh, the PRS supplement 2019. You can see that going from 1997 uh, down you know, we were going from about one, one in a million to three million, all the way now down to, in 2018, a one, in a, one in about 3,000 in Australia. Uh, and the problem with most of this literature is that it's all retrospective data. Uh, clinical case data is often incomplete or inaccurate. The, de the denominator of the cases is often extrapolated. And follow-up in many series is very limited. And we know that the onset of BILCL is delayed usually uh, from six to eight years uh, onwards. So uh, should we be worried? And uh, I'd like to share with you the experience in my practice. Um, and uh, this is uh, 
a 27 year experience between 1992 and 2019. And I'm gonna show you prospectively collected data, um, well documented, and I think that the implant denominator is quite accurate. I think most of the BILCL cases in my patients uh, did in fact return to me and were treated by me. Um, so it's a 25 plus year experience. There were about uh, 3,700 patients with implants, about 6,000 implant reconstructions. Uh, and of these, a la large percentage were breast reconstructions for breast cancer. Um, I would point out that 96% of these patients had textured implants. So my standard follow-up on these patients was, has been yearly follow-up for 10 years and then bi-yearly for uh, over 26 years. Um, silicone implants have always received routine MRI scans at year three and then every two years afterwards. And all the data on these patients with outcomes is entered prospectively into a database that I've maintained uh, over the past uh, 27 years. Additionally, uh, many of these patients are also followed long-term by their oncologists and breast surgeons. And being part of a big institution like uh, MSKCC, uh, the follow-up on these patients is very good. And within this series, it was uh, close to 80%. So uh, what's been the experience? Um, there were about 3,500 patients with uh, textured implants. The median follow-up on this group of patients is uh, eight years. Uh, you can see that about 70% were bilaterals, 96% were biocell or allergan implants with a smattering of uh, mentor and Sientra. So a large uh, percentage of these are allergan. Uh, reconstruct, 97% uh, were uh, reconstructions. And you can see that uh, of the textured implants, there was an even split of about 50-50 between silicone and saline. So what's been the experience during this period of the 3,546 patients, uh, 10 patients in, and actually uh, that's what we've I've published recently. I now have an 11th patient, but using uh, the 10 patients and this data, um, of those 10 patients, you can see that 80% were bilateral reconstructions. Uh, there was an even split 50-50 between silicone and saline implants. A uh, wide variety of uh, breast, uh, breast cancer uh, grades. Um, about 50% got chemotherapy and uh, only one in 10 received radiotherapy for breast cancer. In terms of the clinical characteristics of the presentation, you can see that 80% uh, of these patients, eight out of 10 presented with a seroma only, which is pretty typical. Um, and then two of uh, these presented with both NAS and a seroma, and uh, both of those presented with axillary or internal mammary lymph nodes. So this is not just a totally benign disease. It certainly does, can present uh, with metastatic disease. This is a busy slide, but it basically points out that the median uh, time to development of BILCL is about 11 years in, in my experience, with a range from seven to about 16 years. So you tend to see it, uh, uh, and the, um, um, the length of exposure increases risk. Uh, of the uh, patients, all of these patients underwent uh, implant removal and capsulectomy. Um, one patient received chemotherapy and radiation. So I wanna show you three cases because I think it really represents what this disease is about. Uh, 58 year old with bilateral textured implants, presented 14 years post-op uh, with a large um, seroma. Fine needle aspiration uh, came back positive for uh, ALCL. She had a PET scan that showed no metastatic disease. Uh, this shows you the PET scan and you can see uh, on the left side a large amount of fluid around the uh, implant, it's pretty obvious. She underwent bilateral total capsulectomies, removal of the implants. Uh, there was no gross disease seen in the capsule, but microscopic review demonstrated ALCL within the capsule. Uh, because this was confined to the capsule, she needed no chemo or radiation. This is a typical presentation. You can see it's pretty obvious. This is not uh, questionable swelling. It's usually very obvious. Uh, you can see the two specimens. Uh, um, I generally will uh, remove not just the side with the ALCL, but, but both sides. 
And this is, these are uh, on block uh, capsulectomies. Uh, this is the typical appearance of the fluid. You, kinda, you can see a sort, sort of yellowish straw colored fluid. Uh, the involved capsule is on the right hand side. The other one was uh, benign. Uh, and you can see the amount of fluid that's uh, in there. This is what the uh, uh, capsulectomy and removal of the implant should look like afterwards. So that's uh, the typical uh, case uh, and presentation. And that was about, that was eight out of 10 patients. Uh, case two, a 46 year old who had bilateral mastectomies and reconstruction, again, with silicone uh, textured implants. She presented with a large mass in the upper pole of the breast about 15 years post-op. A core needle biopsy surprisingly showed ALCL. We were expecting breast cancer. And the MRI showed a large mass. Uh, PET scan showed uh, the, the mass lighting up as well as some X-ray lymph nodes. So this is how she presented. If you look at the upper pole of the reconstructed side, uh, there's a fullness there. Uh, the um, CT scan shows a large mass, seven, eight centimeters in, uh, in size. It's invading the pectoralis major muscle. The PET scan uh, shows some hot lymph nodes in the uh, left axilla. So she underwent wide resection of the tumor, the pectoralis, total capsulectomy, and uh, axillary node dissection. Um, she then underwent radiation therapy to the chest wall and the axilla, as well as uh, systemic chemotherapy. She's currently doing uh, well. So this is uh, her at presentation. You can see the mass outline in the upper pole of the left breast. This is uh, the um, chest wall after resection of the uh, tumor and removal of the implant. Um, uh, in the uh, left lower quadrant, you can see a forcep uh, picking up on uh, the large enlarged lymph nodes. So these patients definitely, uh, this disease can definitely metastasize at least to uh, um, local regional areas. Case three, a uh, 51 year old, eight years post-op had a PET scan. This was uh, not related to uh, ALCL, it was just uh, part of her follow-up for her breast cancer. This showed a hot internal mammary node. She had a repeat scan a year later uh, and then uh, a, a biopsy that was inconclusive. A third um, uh, scan still showed the, uh, the positive lymph nodes and she requested uh, resection of the nodes. And again, surprisingly, uh, the pathology was ALCL and not breast cancer. So here's a patient who presented with no uh, symptomatic disease in her uh, reconstructed breast around her implants, nothing lighting up on PET scan except for the positive lymph node in the internal mammary node chain. And you can see the very hot nodes there on the PET scan. Uh, she underwent bilateral total capsulectomies, removal of the implants. We saw no gross, gross disease in either capsule and pathology was not able to identify ALCL within the capsule microscopically. So at present, because um, her, um, she's without evidence of disease, uh, we're just following her and the oncology service decided not to treat her with chemotherapy at present. So those are uh, three sort of representative cases. And I think they, they demonstrate not uh, how the, how typically these cases present, but also uh, that uh, metastatic disease is certainly uh, uh, um, a possibility and that this is not totally benign disease. So based on this uh, experience, what's the risk of developing BILCL with a textured implant? Uh, at least in my uh, series, uh, when you calculate this out, um, it comes out to 0.311 cases per 1,000 person years. As a plastic surgeon, that make, means nothing to me. And it also, the way they calculate these um, uh, risk estimates is that ALCL is gonna uh, develop at a linear rate, starting at day zero and then linearly increasing. But the fact is that it looks like the risk is not linear. So what we did with the data is we looked at, uh, we did a um, Kaplan-Meier uh, predictive curve of what the estimated uh, risk of developing BILCL is over, the, over uh, per year, and the years from implant are on the uh, x-axis and the risk is on the y-axis. And you can see that through about year seven or eight, uh, the risk is essentially zero, but then it climbs up and at least based on this, and th these are small numbers, and you can see that the confidence limits are pretty wide. 
but you can see that uh, the risk starts to jump up to uh, from uh, one in 300 to one in 100 or so at 15 to 20 years. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a concern. Uh, and based on this, uh, as a crude number, the incidence is one out of 354. That's 10 cases out of uh, 3,500. And, um, but unfortunately, since the median follow-up is eight years, as we follow these patients out, I would expect to see some more cases. And since the denominator is fixed, that number is gonna go up. So what's been the impact on my practice? What are current recommendations? Um, uh, as Don, uh, uh, Don's group uh, at Penn State was the first to do, they, um, we decided to send out an information letter and I have 3,500 patients. We have about um, 9,000 in the institution. And we send letters out to all the patients, which was a bit, <coughs> a bit of a nightmare. <coughs> um, telephones were man manned by nurses. Patients were encouraged to come in. And then when the patients come in, uh, the nurse or PA would see them first, go through a lot of the um, literature, and then I would further discuss the issues. And this uh, obviously was uh, 10 to 20 patients in a clinic with um, you know, a half hour per patient. This was a letter we sent out, a fact sheet. Um, what's my current discussion with patients? I tell them that there are no well-documented cases of BILCL in patients with smooth implants, that the FDA and our group do not recommend routine replacement of textured with smooth implants, uh, that the risk of, of BLCL with textured implants is likely higher than what's currently published. And I share my own uh, data, and now that it is published, uh, it's out there. Uh, and also that the risk of developing BILCL is likely higher with the longer age of or time of exposure to the implant. So that's the uh, general discussion. And, and most of these patients obviously are very anxious. They, they want to know what, what should be done. Should they remove the implants? And it's a very, it's a difficult uh, discussion. My current recommendations in 20, uh, now in 2020, I recommend only smooth implants and tissue expanders. And like Mark, it's, it's been over two years that I've been using only smooth implants and tissue expanders. And for all new reconstructions, that's the case. Um, for patients who need a replacement for a leak or contracture, et cetera, I would uh, replace the textured implant with smooth implants. And in the past, with the, if a patient had a bilateral reconstruction, I would replace only the problematic, let's say, leaking implant. Now I recommend replacing both with uh, smooth. So certainly uh, what I do and recommend has changed in the past couple of years. These are the four main options that I, that I offer to patients with textured implants. First observation, routine follow-up. I tell them this is the FDA's recommendation. Uh, <clears throat> second, replace the textured implant with a smooth implant. And the discussion there is that uh, it is likely going to reduce the risk, but we don't know. And it probably won't totally eliminate uh, risk. Uh, a third option would be replacing the textured implant with the flap, and some of my patients do go for this. And the fourth would be just to remove the implant. This tends to be mostly my older patients, but I have a few younger patients who, uh, you know, uh, want to have nothing to do with an implant and just want them removed. And in all these cases, when the patient really wants surgery, I do stress that um, uh, removing or re and or replacing the implant does not totally eliminate the risk of developing BIOCL. So the main changes in my practice in the past year or two, um, patient notification and education, uh, I think this is something that is uh, critical. We should all do it. Um, and although we were very concerned about the medical legal ramifications, uh, I can tell you that patients are incredibly grateful that they got the letter. They're incredibly anx anxious. Some of them come in quite angry, but after the discussion, invariably they'll thank me because they'll say, you know what, Dr. Cordero, many of my friends never got a letter. So for all of those, uh, all of you out there, I'd say it's a very, very worthwhile thing. Uh, currently, I exclusively use only smooth implants and tissue expanders. I have a much lower threshold to replace textured with smooth. Um, and certainly anybody with any question of uh, uh, ALCL, uh, um, seromas, et cetera, need to be aggressively evaluated. Um, so that's basically uh, how this uh, disease has impacted my practice. 
uh, and where it stands, and it certainly has had a, a big impact. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. That uh, was very informative and I think gives us the kind of level of concern that we all should have uh, for a series where you followed your patients so carefully. Um, so Stan, before we take a couple of questions, I just wanted to ask Mark and put an exclamation point on this. Mark, is there or has there been any uh, case of BIA ALCL related to a smooth implant? No, uh, not to date, uh, not in any case report, case series, uh, registry uh, worldwide. It's important to point out that the FDA, when they release their data, uh, they'll sometimes show a, a certain proportion of uh, the adverse event reports having smooth uh, however, uh, they're quick to note that uh, there was either no clinical history involved or a mixed clinical history with a textured device. Uh, we uh, feel comfortable saying that to date, we have never seen a pure smooth implant case with this disease. Thanks. The other point that I want, another thing that I'd like to put an exclamation mark on was um, it seemed for a while that the Ralstonia bacterium, and it, it fit the story nicely because it was in a group of bacteria that had been shown to cause uh, gastric cancer, that we then extrapolated that to being a causative agent in BIA ALCL. Can you tell us the, again what the status of the microbiome is? Is this an implicated factor. Uh, so with regards to what's been uh, previously published uh, was the 2016 study by Hugh et al, um, which really uh, brought to light the bio. In essence, uh, the thought was is that a, a bacteria, Piketty Ralstonia, uh, was leading to the development of the disease. And then we see a number of manuscripts come out since then talking about how can we better fight Ralstonia. Uh, what agents can kill Ralstonia better? And uh, it's unfortunate because um, that research wasn't able to be uh, replicated. And even within the institution at Macquarie University in Australia, uh, they weren't able to continue to show that Ralstonia specifically uh, was the factor uh, that was involved in the development of the disease. Um, what it was nice, uh, so, so at this point, based on what is published, um, uh, all, all we can ne necessarily say is that Rostonia is not the culprit. Um, at the uh, Rome meeting and uh, uh, the World Consensus Conference, Anand Diva uh, did uh, present new data. It is unpublished, it is not peer reviewed, in which uh, he feels that there may be a role for uh, lipopolysaccharides in gram negative uh, bacteria. Um, I, I've spoken to him, I think, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he said that um, the research is coming along and uh, we hope to see a, a manuscript on that subject. But for right now, uh, there is no published uh, manuscript specifically with regards to that um, uh, thinking of uh, pathogenesis. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, Peter, would you mind uh, just turning off your share screen at the top so that we can take uh, a look at Excellent. Did that do it? Yeah. Yeah. So why don't we? Yep. So, yep. A few questions. Yep. I can read them if you'd like, Don. Well, I think we've gone down from, uh, we're down to John Patochny and yep. um, yeah. both right. of you guys acknowledged what we'd done at Penn State. I just want to make it clear that this was actually John's study and it was John's initiative to send the letters out to all of our patients. And, so John has asked you guys a question regarding the two biocell textured tissue expander cases. Do you know how long they had those expanders in place? Uh, well, I do know uh, one of them specifically we have good details on. Uh, that's in an upcoming uh, manuscript uh, that's going to be in uh, 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 PRS. Um, and in that case, they had the tissue expander for 14 months and then had a smooth implant for several years and then developed the disease. 
I think we could all agree that 14 months is a prolonged amount of time to have a tissue expander. Uh, so that is longer than what you'd expect. Um, it is unclear how long the patient had it in the second case. Uh, so the details are even less clear. I, I really caution in trying to make a lot of conclusions based on one or two cases. And so we have to be careful about that. Uh, but definitely in this case, there was a prolonged time exposure to that biocell. And I, I just want to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Patachny uh, who asked that question on uh, his role of uh, alerting patients at uh, Penn State. Um, I, I feel like we were uh, much more after the fact, um, after Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, but MD Anderson has done it as well. And our experience has been very similar. It was a, it was a difficult process to do and I uh, can't be happier that we did. Uh, patients responded. Uh, well, uh, they it, it did not create a lot of fear, and, and most uh, women uh, were thankful um, for receiving that information. Um, um, so Mark, there were a couple of points you made that I thought were interesting. You said that currently the recommendation uh, is that um, if the patient has the disease, uh, you do the total capsulectomy on block, et cetera, but now you recommend replacing with a smooth implant. That's not something I do. I would personally leave an implant out, period, just because we don't, uh, you know, I don't think we know enough. But where did that recommendation come from? Uh, so we, we uh, uh, last March, uh, we had uh, supplements come out in uh, both PRS and ASJ. Uh, so simultaneously in one month, uh, 15 articles from 55 authors on uh, all aspects of the ALCL. Um, and uh, uh, one of the articles was on the reconstruction of breast implant ALCL. In that manuscript, we looked at uh, 25 patients who had received some type of reconstruction, and we saw that uh, patients were able to be reconstructed if there was disease. And uh, we came up with the algorithm that if disease was outside of the capsule, invasive into the chest wall, or in the lymph nodes to delay that reconstruction at least six months, if not one year. But for patients where the disease was confined to the capsule by preoperative PET CT scan, then we feel, felt comfortable reconstructing them with a, um, a smooth surface uh, uh, breast implant or an autologous reconstruction, uh, or in one of the patients got uh, serial fat grafting. Again, the thinking behind that was is that um, while we don't have long-term follow-up on those patients, we can say in the 23 years of uh, history that we have on breast implant ALCL, without seeing a single case purely associated with the smooth implant, we felt that that was a safe, um, uh, a safe to offer to patients. So there's a question from Michael Sorotis from Rome uh, to you, Peter. I believe many surgeons, mostly here in Europe, fear that ALCL will lead to a change of their surgical routine in terms of moving to smooth implants only, and it's taking them out of their comfort zone. How would you comment on that? So that they're not comfortable just using smooth implants. Um, very good question. Uh, you know, um, I have always been a huge fan of textured implants. Uh, practically from the time I started uh, practice. And I've always felt that uh, shaped textured implants give the best results. That's why I use them. And I personally was incredibly uneasy about switching now to round smooth implants. My feeling was that it, the shape would not be as good, that there would be a lot of uh, depression in the upper pole, that I would need to do a lot of fat grafting to fill in that, that depression that these implants can move around, that they, uh, there's an increased risk of developing capsular contracture. So I had all of those misgivings, but I think uh, I went ahead with switching to round smooth because I thought that was the safe thing to do. The very interesting thing is I've been doing this now. Uh, I have patients who are coming up on two years follow-up uh, with round, uh, round implant reconstructions from, from, the, from, the, from day one. So these are new reconstructions. 
most of them look very good. And I've had to modify what I do a little bit uh, from what I used to do. You, uh, I take a lot more care about making sure the upper pole is nice and full um, in those cases. But I also have this large group of patients that I've now uh, swapped out uh, shaped implants to round. And the really interesting thing is these, these patients have had the experience of both. And I don't have the data yet, but I think uh, my general impression is that many of them are just as happy with their new round implants. And more than half of them, uh, in, in the majority, feel that they prefer their, their round implants because they move around a little bit, they're softer, and they, they describe them as being more natural. They certainly don't look more natural, but I think to them, they feel more natural. So for those of you who have misgivings, I would say give it a shot. And uh, really, we need to do the right thing for patients. And uh, uh, surprisingly, uh, the results with round smooth implants, I think, are very comparable, just as good, maybe slightly different. Thanks, Peter. And then there's another one from Michael as well. So a question to everybody. In diagnosed ALCL cases, how long do you wait before you offer autologous reconstruction or a smooth implant? Mark, I know you've written about this. Yeah, so again, if the disease is confined to the capsule and we feel comfortable with the resection on day of surgery and we've had that imaging showing no disease extending beyond that, we do feel comfortable doing an immediate reconstruction um, on a day of surgery, um, in, including an autologous reconstruction. It is critically important, though, that you have to feel comfortable with your resection and you, um, and you have to feel comfortable with your preoperative imaging. But I think that that would apply to even breast cancer. You, if you had a, 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 a very bad invasive disease and you were worried about your margins, you wouldn't do an immediate reconstruction. If you felt comfortable with your resection with breast cancer, as we do every single day, then you would feel comfortable with an immediate reconstruction. And we think that that comfort level comes from not invading into the chest or uh, having metastasized. Peter? Um, my approach to this is, uh, you know, I think uh, the patient has already demonstrated that they, they don't like implants and certainly they're textured implants and for whatever reason, their body has reacted and they've developed the BILCL. I'm not comfortable enough uh, um, and I don't know enough about the disease to be sure that putting in a smooth implant after someone uh, has had ALCL is, is uh, safe or a good thing to do. And so I personally don't recommend it. And um, I think a flap is reasonable, but I would wait, you know, a reasonable period of time, a year or two, even in the patients with um, very benign looking disease, because we know that there are cases of patients who have the, uh, in theory, a good operation, et cetera, who then uh, get recurrences. So I personally wouldn't rush into doing any further reconstruction. And I think most of these patients, you know, uh, at least my patients, they've had breast cancer. They've now had the BILCL. None of them are really that interested in doing anything further. They're more than happy to be followed for a while and they're not in a rush. Uh, I don't have any personal patients who have had augmentations who uh, developed the disease. I think that that might be a, a slightly different group of patients and there it becomes more of an issue. I've had at least a couple of patients referred to me who were did not like the idea of removing an implant, period. And I, I, my approach to this was, I think your implant needs to be removed and I would not replace it and they've gone elsewhere. So, uh, you know, I think for uh, uh, aesthetic patients, maybe a slightly different perspective, but I think most of these patients are not that interested in, in having another reconstruction, at least not for a while. Stan, how are we doing? We're doing fine. We have uh, another question or two for the Q&A. It looks like we have another one, which... Uh, We're doing time. Okay, time Harrop, wise, Harrop, I'll yeah. continue arguing. So Rob Harrop, to, to both of you, and, and specifically you, to you, Peter. You know, you gave your options, A, B, C, or D. Um, so question to you was, what proportion of asymptomatic patients, after you've had the discussion, choose B, C, or D? 
And is this different in aesthetic as opposed to recon patients? So the question is what proportion uh, want surgery and, and not observation? Yep. Uh, I can't really comment on the aesthetic patients because I don't have that many. I've had a couple that I'm, I'm going to be replacing, but me, uh, most uh, have not wanted anything done, but it's a very small number. Of the uh, reconstruction patients, um, I, I would say ballpark to date, I have replaced about 10% of the total number. And there's probably another 10% that are lined up at some point to, who, who may want to do something. It's interesting because I've been having this discussion with patients now for two years from the time when we first, it first the sort of broke and we sent the letter out about a year and a half ago. And uh, the number of patients back then, two years ago, that wanted to do anything were a significantly smaller number. But they, since these patients come in every year or two and I see them again, the second time around, the numbers and have gone up. My own personal numbers in two years went from uh, about five or six cases to uh, now 10, 11 cases. And when, when patients hear those numbers, I think they're much more concerned and they're much more likely to want to do something. So I think as the uh, um, risk estimates continue to go up and uh, I think more patients are going to want to do this. So, uh, but I'd say 10 to 20% are actually uh, doing something. Okay. So Stan? Yes. It's now it's uh, five past nine. Yes. I think if it's okay with you, we've got a comment here from, um, <clears throat> from Terry McGregor, who's a BIA ALCL patient from Canada. Mm -hmm. And she comments, may we suggest patient anxiety be acknowledged? rather than managed with don't worry. The situation is naturally worrisome. It affects a human's basic instinct of safety and security from illness or injury. And I think that's very true. It, it's so important that we listen to our patients. And Terry, thank you for that comment. Stan, I think... Uh, thank you, Terry. All right, Stan, thank you. Thank you. Either. And uh, this uh, webinar has been recorded. It'll be posted on the AAPS website, which is aaps1921.org. And we thank you all for attending this evening and uh, most uh, certainly thank our presenters and Dr. Mackay. Thanks, folks. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night.